the, 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 the south exposure is, is, is precious. Now this is a, a, a sort of a rough layout of a subdivision that, that we're working in in southwest Edmonton. It's a, a new subdivision on the banks of the White Mud Ravine and uh, the, the owners of the site, the, the uh, Poole family, have mandated that it be s developed sustainably. And so that's how we got involved. The, the uh, developer heard Gordon at the CMHC Housing Outlook Conference a few years ago, and, and we've been working with them for a while. But they've already laid the, the roads out. They've got quite a thin strip of land at the north end of the site, and it's very hard to orient the lots anything but east-west. And so we're, you know, we're, we want to do as well as we can on here, but we've got, you know, one hand tied behind our backs. The, the predominant views are to the east and the west, so that's where you'd want to put your windows. And the result of that is going to be the danger, f first of all, heat loss out of those windows. Uh, that cannot be compensated, that, that, that's, that doesn't have a, a, a corresponding heat gain associated with it. So, and, and then our, our side yards are facing south. Well, there are limits to how much glass you can put on the side yard, and you also don't particularly want to be looking at your, the side of your neighbor's house, even if it doesn't block the sun. But there's a fire code that restricts the, the area to about 7%. So that, you know, that site already is down in the, in the 8,000 kilowatt hour a year range that makes it very, very difficult to, to do much about. And, you know, it's possible that, that and you can see that, like the, the sun in this model here is approximately November 20th or so, somewhere around, around 10 o'clock in the morning. And you can see that there's a sort of a sawtooth effect. The, the, uh, the sun is hitting the rooftops and you could get PV up on the rooftops and, and you know, you could conceivably get a pretty good output from, a, from an, an array up there. But, um, but you, can't, you can't make up for the loss of that, uh, that passive solar. Um, so an, an, another situation, this is a, a site over in Belgravia that we were involved with for a little while. Nice south facing lots, but, but uh, the, the city boulevard trees are, are providing enough shading that, uh, that the potential for passive solar and renewable collection is seriously compromised. And I mean, I love trees there, but although I'm, I'm, I'm starting to have, you know, some mixed feelings about some of them. Uh, um, that, that uh, I'm not the tree hugger I used to be. <laughs> That this you know this is a, this would be a fabulous site. Um, you know the compromise solution here would be that you you could work with the trees a little bit and go really heavily in the passive solar department and it, with with the assumption that in the winter when the sun is low it'll shine under those branches and through them and then in the summer they'll prevent uh, any overheating and that's a great thing except that the the shading from the branches is very significant and and when it comes to putting renewables on the house really particularly photovoltaic you don't really care when it is you want to get that electricity generated when the sun's shining which is typically uh, you're getting your best production in in the in the sort of April to, to October uh, uh, time frame so the so the ideal situation is a south facing backyard here in Edmonton and this is a site of the Belgravia house sometime in November the the shading from the little outbuildings is not hitting the house uh, we pulled the house far enough into the backyard there are almost no tr no trees there and uh, you know in your immediate backyard you can control whether there are trees or not you can plant you know lower trees and that that sort of thing and uh, you're also less concerned about integrating the collectors with the uh, with the look of the house so that you're free on the street side of the house to pursue any any kind of shape or style of house that, that suits you so it's important I think to to actually have your eyes open and know what portion of the sun you're going to be able to access for for all uh, types of, of solar input. And uh, there, there are a number of ways of doing that. Gordon and I went havers on a on a little device called the Solmetric Sun Eye. And there, there are other ways to do this. There are some lower tech ways. There are some free little programs on the internet that uh, look like they would work quite well. But uh, I, I really like this one. It, it, uh, uh, it's a little fisheye camera. It, it takes a picture of the sky and then, and then gives you three different outputs and it plots the sun path and, and the obstacles. 
and it'll then give you a bar graph that'll tell you what percent of the available solar radiation is unobstructed. And uh, it also has this nifty little function. You can take an eraser and erase the obstruction and see what, the, what difference it makes. It's not precise, but it's, it's close enough. But however you do it, I think it's important uh, you know, this is, we're, we're all optimists or we wouldn't be considering doing this. And um, uh, it, it's, it's easy to let that optimism kind of get away with you. You should, uh, you know, check it out and, 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 and really let the numbers uh, tell you what you're going to get because it'll affect the way you want to design the house. So once you've decided that it's, it's a good enough site uh, or that you can live with the limitations, you would then start to design the house using all the considerations you'd normally uh, um, ha have involved the, the uh, you know, how much space you need, uh, where, the, where the views are and that, that sort of thing. And, and in the process be, be looking for opportunities to exploit the whatever passive solar potential you have. So organize the living spaces which would be where you'd want to have your bigger windows along the south and uh, try to try to have functions that need less light uh, along the north and and I mean you still have to make the house look good from the from the street and, and all of that sort of thing but but just uh, you know w within limits uh, maximize the the potential the, the potential solar exposure and and think also about in shaping the roof that that um, uh, you know how you might accommodate uh, photovoltaic uh, panels or solar domestic hot water. I mean, at this point, uh, we we don't know how how big those would need to be, um, but uh, you know, start start thinking about it, um, and 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 try and keep the shape simple. The closer you are to a square, uh, the better. If you're going to be elongated, ideally, it would be in a, in an east-west direction that would give you more passive solar exposure. Um, but keeping it compact and not uh, not lots of big jogs, uh, the, the jogs really add length and, and size to the building perimeter without necessarily adding that much more square footage. And so, you know, the more compact, the better. Uh, you know, it's got to look good. It's got to be, you know, enjoyable. Don't, I, I don't make a make a completely boring box um, so just to give you an idea of the sort of size range that we've we've been able to get to to uh, net zero or near net zero so far they they, they seem to be in the sort of uh, 1800 to 2000 square foot range um, so reasonably good sized houses you know by by some measure they're probably smaller than average um, but uh, keeping the house size down will will save money every which way the cost per square foot will go up but the total amount of cost will be less. Uh, and, and again, try to keep the house surface area to volume ratio, you know, keep it as compact as possible. 